Hey everyone, we all come from different places, cultures, and backgrounds, but we all have one thing in common. We all have to eat. Food is a great way to learn about other people and cultures. So join me for today's video as we take a look at 15 bizarre foods you won't believe actually exist. Number 15. Ballot. People eat eggs just about everywhere in the world. Whether they're fried, scrambled, or soft-boiled, they work for just about every meal and can always be packed away as a light snack. But ballot takes things to the next level. It starts out as your typical boiled egg, but once you peel away that layer of shell, instead of finding a hard yolk, you're treated to the bird's embryo. Typically using a duck's egg, the fertilized eggs are incubated in the sun or buried in the sand and stored in baskets to keep in the warmth. In order for the embryo to develop normally, it must be exposed to heat for the correct period of time, as if it were nestled under its mother in the nest. And after a few days, the eggs are held under a light to see what the growing embryo looks like. And when you can see a beak, feathers, claws, and barely developed bones, they're just about ready to be taken to market. And when it's ready to go, literally everything inside is going to be eaten, fluids and all. And boy, does that ballot go down with a crunch. And while it may seem odd to many, the ballot can be found by both restaurants and street vendors alike across Southeast Asian countries, most notably in the Philippines. Number 14. Tuna Eyeballs When it comes to Japan, consumers and cooks both tend to eat the entire animal, letting nothing go to waste. It perhaps comes as both a sign of respect to the animal as well as a why not? Animals in the wild consume nearly every morsel of their prey, so why can't humans? The land of the rising sun is known for eating plenty of fish, especially raw, and they don't stop when they get to the head. In fact, you can go to many grocery stores and purchase a nice pack of giant tuna eyeballs. And since the eyes are an organ, they're pretty cheap. Tuna eyes are prepared in all sorts of ways, with local restaurants typically boiling or steaming them before seasoning them with garlic or soy sauce. But the one thing that may be hard to get over is their sheer size, about the size of a tennis ball. And if you're ordering these at a Japanese izakaya as a snack or appetizer, then prepare yourself to guzzle down the tough exterior sclera, lens, iris, and scrum diddlyumptious gelatinous fluid inside. Or if it's cooked properly, you can go straight for the soft inner contents of the eye and suck it out like marrow. But those who have had tuna eyeballs will tell you that it actually doesn't taste like fish. They're rather bland, tasting more like squid or a hard-boiled egg. But if you head to the right izakaya, the chefs there can prepare you a shot of tuna tears, which is made from mixing soju and the fluids of the raw tuna lens. Kanpai. Number 13. Jellied Moose Nose Residents of Alaska and Canada's northernmost region are all treated to the local delicacy of moose meat. You can use it to make steak, sausage, and even pizza toppings. But there's one dish that is reserved for the bravest of foodies and most stalwart of stomachs, jellied moose nose. How the hell did an idea for such a dish even come about? Well, the ingenious hunters in the greater northwest could rely on the whole moose to feed a family for weeks, using just about every part of the animal. The moose has a long, bulbous snout, and somewhere along the line, the indigenous communities figure out a way to better preserve it, creating a jelly. Jellied moose nose is akin to European head cheese, trapping cuts of moose nose with a gelatinized broth. So while local to the region, the method of cooking isn't all that outlandish. The fur must be removed prior to cooking, of course, either by being singed off over an open fire, peeled off after the nose has been boiled, or simply skinning the nose. Chefs then slice the nose and simmer it with onions, garlic, and an array of other spices, which may include cinnamon, cloves, allspice, or mustard seeds. Meat from other parts of the moose heads, such as the ears and lips, can even be added to the mix. Once the nosy concoction is cooled down, the cook lays the pieces of the meat in a loaf pan, douses them with broth, and places the mixture in the refrigerator so the broth can solidify. The resulting jelly is served like a loaf of bread and eaten in slices. But just like chicken or turkey, a moose's nose contains both white and dark meat, so there's plenty of flavors to be had. But now the real question is, have you got any toast? Number 12. Kasumarzu Alright, try not to lose your lunch with this one. Also known as the ham skipper, the cheese skipper fly is interesting for a few reasons. First, their larvae have the strange ability to launch themselves into the air. They feed on decaying matter and have even been found in the exhumed remains of Egyptian mummies. They enjoy putrid-smelling meats like old ham, bacon, and beef, but what they really love is moldy cheese. 
The females will lay their eggs in the old food, and once they hatch, the larva will go to town. But what do these little stinkers have to do with food? Well, if you travel to Italy, you can enjoy this famous or infamous pecorino cheese known as casumarzu, which has cheese skippers intentionally introduced into it. The larvae digest and ferment the cheese and are left inside to be eaten by us humans. This stinky, rotten cheese is especially pungent and gooey, and thousands of maggots can be seen and felt wiggling inside. Maybe this food is best paired with more than a few glasses of fine Italian wine. Number 11. Sustroming Swedish for sour herring, Sustroming is a Swedish delicacy known more for its smell than its taste. In fact, once the can is opened, you may not even be able to get that close enough to try it because it's some of the strongest smelling stuff you'll ever experience. All it is, though, is lightly salted herring, typically from the Baltic Sea. But despite the stench, Sustroming has been a staple in Swedish cuisine since the 16th century. So what makes this fish so stinky? Well, the herring is salted just barely enough to keep the raw fish from rotting. And when I say barely enough, I mean just barely enough. The herring ferments for the next six months, with the smell being so potent that you really don't need to see it to know it's done. In fact, the fifth day of Thursday in Sweden is known as Sustroming Day, where people will eat this outside rather than fill their home with the sweet smell of sour fish. There's even a specific way to open the can, keeping the brine from spurting into an unsuspecting diner's face and the gas from out of their nostrils. Sustroming is usually served with potatoes and tumbrod, a thin, either soft or crispy bread used to make a sandwich. Yummy! Number 10. Huilacoche Anyone living near a solid taco stand has seen the word huilacoche on the menu, but very rarely do people order it simply because they don't know what it is. But huilacoche, or corn smut despite being a little strange, is quite delicious. All it is really is a corn fungus, but if you think about it as a Mexican truffle, it can really lighten the mood. This delicacy is a disease that grows on the corn cob, eventually killing its host and taking on the form of puffy gray clouds. So if a farmer finds this on their corn, it isn't the worst thing in the world because properly preserved huitlacoche can be taken to market and typically sold for a higher price than the corn itself. So what can you make with something like this? Well, a lot actually. You can use it to make a Mexican-style succotash, throwing it in there with onions, garlic, peppers, chorizo, and shrimp, all of which blend nicely with the earthy and woody flavors of the fungus. Or it can be thrown into a salsa to mellow out the heat of the peppers and add a little extra texture. You can even throw it in eggs in the morning. But one of the more popular ways to eat huilacoche is in a taco. Number 9. Stargazy Pie if you're not into the idea of looking at your meal only for it to be staring right back at you, then steer clear of stargazy pie. While the name may sound like something romantic, this slice of English cuisine is quite the opposite. Traditionally served on December 23rd as a pre-Christmas meal, this Cornish pie all begins with eggs and potatoes under a nice crispy pastry crust, and then add in baked pilchards. But as the name would suggest, it's not stargazy pie unless the fish are sticking straight up with their heads breaching the crust as if gasping for air. So a cuisine like this begs the question of where the hell did this come from? Well, history says Tom Barcock, a local fisherman, saved his village from famine when he went fishing during a violent storm in the winter, returning with enough fish to feed the townsfolk. Only his first pie had a few extra ingredients in there like sand eels, herring, dogfish, and ling. And while all of those seafaring creatures are still fine to use today, it's the pilchard that's still the key ingredient. The pie is eaten to honor the legendary Mr. Barcock's efforts and the bravery on that cold winter's night, and should be eaten to heart's content. Number 8. Haggis Perhaps one of the better-known dishes on this list, haggis hails from the heart of Scotland, serving as the national dish. Haggis is a thick pudding, but snack pack this is not, because it's made of liver, heat, and the lungs of sheep, all minced up and mixed with either beef or mutton suet, the fat around the animal's kidney, oatmeal to thicken it up, and seasoned with onion, cayenne, and other spices. But the fun doesn't stop there. Once that mixture is, well, mixed, it's packed into a sheep's stomach and then boiled. It's not uncommon to serve up the haggis with a side of mashed potatoes and turnips, but this savory and affordable dish goes all the way back to the 18th century, celebrated in Robert Burns' To a Haggis. 
But nowadays, the haggis ceremony is accompanied by ceremony and bagpipes on Burns' night on January 25th, the Scottish poet's birthday. It's certainly not the strangest food we've seen today, but with so many awful ingredients combined, it can certainly be intimidating. But nothing like a little liquid courage to help you taste it, as haggis is always best washed down with a glass of Scottish whiskey. Number 7. Haukach What is there to say about haukach besides my pronunciation is terrible? Should I start with how long it takes to prepare, or how about the strong smell of ammonia? Well, let's start at the beginning. What is it made of? Greenland shark, the longest living vertebrates on Earth, which typically are blind and grow to be about 24 feet long and live to be about 400 years old. But when something is this old, their meat becomes toxic and can make you sick. Good thing, then, that the Vikings of old found a way around that shark-induced sickness, burying the pieces of the centuries-old shark meat under dirt and rocks for weeks on end to neutralize the toxin. Once dug up, the Vikings would hang the meat, allowing it to cure and age some more. The end result? Haukaut. Loved by some, hated by many, this has become an Icelandic delicacy full of uric acid, the smell of which is enough to make you faint. The very few brave enough who have tasted this shark flesh say it has a cheese-like texture, with the belly meat being chewier and tasting like a strong blue cheese. Sounds like the type of food that will immediately clear the sinuses. And while taste can differ from shark to shark, each chunk of this has one thing in common. The urine aftertaste. Ugh. That's why it's always, always washed down with Brennivin, Iceland's signature spirit. Number 6. Kosh Depending on where you are in the world, it's not uncommon to eat just about every part of an animal. We've seen fish eyes in Japan and kidney fat in Scotland. But head to Armenia and you can find a dish that's called kosh, which is made of just about every part of the sheep, taking ingredients from head to toe. Kosh is quite the medieval delicacy being mentioned in texts dating back to the 12th century, and the ceremony or rituals around consuming it have only evolved since then. Today, it's quite common to eat kosh with a group of friends, family, and even strangers. Some diners will forego eating the day before in preparation. Others will insist on eating with just their bare hands, but everyone agrees to enjoy the kosh with a few sides of vodka. It is quite a beautiful tradition for something that, for some, may come off as a bit grisly. This boiled stew is made with everything from head to feet to tripe, either from cow, sheep, or both all simmering for hours in the pot along with peppers and onions, pickles and radishes, and can come with a side of bread and cheese depending on the region. This odd yet tasty stew doesn't have to be a nightmare meal either. In fact, kosh is often served up as a hair of the dog meal, meaning it's the perfect stew after a night of heavy drinking. Number 5. Natto Hailing from Japan, natto is another fermented food that often turns the heads and noses of those seeing and smelling it for the first time. A traditional side dish, natto is made from fermenting whole soybeans, and while that may sound pretty tame, it's when you examine it in your bowl that things really get bizarre. We may have all been told not to play with our food growing up, but it's tough not to do that with natto. When you hold it up with chopsticks, the soybeans are all held together in a viscous paste that prevents them from separating, but stretches and falls slowly down. In other words, it's kind of gross to look at, but that doesn't stop people from having it for breakfast many mornings, throwing it over some rice or serving it with a pinch of strong karashi mustard. Despite the incredibly powerful smell, strong flavor, and all-around slimy, sticky texture, natto is incredibly popular and can be found in just about any convenience store in the country. But in a 2009 survey, 70% of Japanese citizens said they like the taste, with many others saying they don't like it but eat it out of pure habit. Number 4. Sanakji Prepared properly, it's fine to eat raw fish or even raw beef in the form of tartare, but the Korean delicacy sanakji turns that notion all the way up to 11. It's octopus, but instead of eating parts of the animal raw, you eat it whole. And by raw, I mean alive. When the dish is served, the severed octopus tentacles are writhing and wriggling on the plate, still living despite being detached from the main body, and so they may put up somewhat of a fight as you try to nab them with chopsticks. But once you take hold, they're served with a side of sesame oil for dipping, and it's down the hatch from there. The thing is, though, that diners need to eat it fast, because those suction cups are still working, and if they don't latch onto your face, they can latch onto your throat as you try to swallow them which is why sanakji is usually washed down with a glass of soju. It's quite common amongst Korean bars and restaurants and can be eaten as both a full meal or a late-night snack. But it's when the dish is served abroad that criticism begins. 
The thing about octopi is that they lack a centralized nervous system, and so the majority of their neurons are found in their tentacles instead of their brains, hence the wiggling on the plate. Number 3. Rocky Mountain Oysters the Rocky Mountains of the United States home to deer, black bears, beavers, and bats. But one thing you will not find here are oysters. So then what the hell are Rocky Mountain oysters? Well, they're bull testicles. The male organs are removed, skinned, coated in flour, pepper, and salt, and then it's into the deep fryer. They're usually served as an appetizer or bar food with a side of fries, and you'll find these Rocky Mountain oysters in mostly parts of Canada, where cattle ranching is more prevalent, meaning male animal castrations are pretty common. But this unique delicacy has also made its way to other parts of the world, where it's given equally colorful names. Head down to the Texas Panhandle, where they're referred to as calf fries, or take a trip to Central and South America, where the dish is lovingly referred to as huevos de toro. And while these not oysters may seem a little morbid to some, they actually allow ranchers to put a part of the animal that would normally be tossed to good use. Number 2. Century Egg What's the oldest food you've ever eaten? Day-old spaghetti, two-day-old sandwich, or maybe some week-old meat that sent you straight to the bathroom? But what about a hundred-year-old egg? Century eggs are a delicacy in certain Chinese provinces made from preserving duck, chicken, or quail eggs in a nice mixture of clay, eggs, and salt for months at a time. And while they don't actually sit in there for a hundred years, the finished product smells just as bad. The eggs are absolutely putrid, with the whites having turned a blackish purple and the yolks dark green. Cracking one of these open is more than enough to make your eyes water, and they're said to emit a strong sulfur smell. And other than peeling and rinsing these old eggs, they're ready to be eaten either on their own or as a side dish. It's not uncommon to find them with a nice black vinegar drizzle or wrapped in slices of pickled ginger roots as street food in Gangshou, or chopped up with cold tofu in Shanghai. There's a century egg out there for everyone. Joy. Number 1. Tongxi Dan If you thought the century egg was rough, then just wait till you hear about this one. Tongxi dan, also known as urine eggs, are considered a delicacy in the Chinese coastal province of Zhejiang. And they certainly live up to their name, because these hard-boiled eggs are made by boiling the egg in a young boy's urine. So every day these egg vendors go to the boy's primary school and collect buckets of urine from the toilets, and preferably the urine doesn't come from anyone over the age of 10. There is literally no explanation as to why this practice occurs, and there have been zero proven health benefits so far, but it's a tradition for centuries nonetheless, and plenty of locals are happy to chow down on this springtime snack. So, if you're ever in the Zhejiang province and you have a hankering from some Tongzi Dan, but don't know exactly where to find them, all you have to do is follow the smell, which as you can imagine is incredibly potent while the urine is being boiled. It takes almost the entire day to make them. Once the cooks have the urine, they soak the eggs, peel off the shells, and then boil them some more for the next few hours. And as the urine evaporates, the vendors just keep adding more. And as these eggs sell for just 25 cents a pop, the vendor will tell you that they relieve joint pain and help with longevity. Of course they do. I'll see you next time. Watch our binge-watching playlist if you'd like to watch all of our most popular top 15 videos. Grab a drink, grab a snack, and get ready to binge.